This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make lightning protection easy. If your wind turbines are due for maintenance or repairs, install our Strike Tape Retrofit LPS upgrade at the same time. A Strike Tape installation is the quick, easy solution that provides a dramatic, long lasting boost to the factory lightning protection system. Forward thinking wind site owners install Strike Tape today to increase uptime tomorrow. Learn more in the show notes of today's podcast. Welcome back. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And I'm Rosemary Barnes. And this is the Uptime Podcast, bringing you the latest in wind energy tech, news, and policy. Welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, we've got a lot of financial talk. We'll talk about the future of pricing and where prices are today and why this is concerning some top OEMs. And I mean, really everyone around the industry. Prices have fallen dramatically, which is a good thing, but also maybe to the point where this is going to put a lot of pressure on uh, owners, operators, everyone, as the price continues to fall for wind-generated power. Uh, We'll talk about Texas. We'll talk about offshore grids and connecting to them and how there might be some bottleneck difficulties that we hadn't uh, previously foreseen. We'll talk a little bit about GRE, uh, GE and ORE Catapult, who will be studying how to continue cutting offshore wind costs, uh, lease sales, and also an interesting Japan uh, Japanese startup that will try to bring offshore wind energy to, sh- to the shore via a battery-filled ship. So interesting idea. We'll talk about that towards the end. Before we get going... Uh, be sure to subscribe to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter. Uh, if you want to get update on this podcast, uh, our new content, and everything else around the web as far as wind and renewables, as well as Rosemary's awesome YouTube channel where she's doing twice a month uh, live streams. And I believe you said we have one of your of one of our uh, past guests will be joining you soon. And I think our guests here on the podcast can catch that on the replay. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. We've got um, Nick Gordon, who's going to be talking blade aerodynamics. It's a topic that I get asked questions about a lot. Um, why wind turbines don't have winglets, whether we take inspiration from killer whales and um, put tubercles on the leading edge of wind turbines and yeah, other other questions that, that viewers come up with during the live stream. So yeah, check that recording out. Yeah. So if you're new to uh, our YouTube channel to, or to Rosemary's YouTube channel, definitely check that out. She's been doing a fantastic job and her channel is growing fast. So let's get started with Texas and with uh, their goal to not have a repeat of last winter, where obviously their grid sort of had a meltdown with their sort of once in a generation storm. Uh, Tons of icing sent a lot of their power offline, not only wind, but uh, natural gas, everything. So they've won in in one step. They've uh, voted to cut their high system wide offer cap from nine thousand dollars per megawatt hour to five thousand dollars per megawatt hour. Now, this I think is bears some explaining because people are wondering, like, well, who's paying five thousand dollars for a megawatt hour, right? And this is typically like ten dollars, twenty dollars, something like that. Um, Rosemary, can you explain, like, what is this number and, and why is it relevant and when would it come into play? Yeah, so it's a, a specific type of electricity market um, in Texas. It's actually really similar to the main grid in Australia, the national electricity market, which covers like the whole eastern side of Australia. Um, and here we have a range, the price per megawatt hour can vary between negative 1,000 um, and positive 15,000. So quite a lot higher than Texas um, even, you know, started out. And the, the point of the system is because it's just um, – it, there's, it, you only pay for the energy in this system. So you don't pay anybody to, you know, be online waiting to kick in if, if extra um, supply is needed. So the high prices, you don't reach them very often. You know, your average price is going to be somewhere in the tens of, of dollars per megawatt hour, but then you have these big spikes. So in Australia, you get spikes, um, in summer evenings, usually when there's, um, you know, everyone gets home and turns their air conditioner on and then you might get the, the spikes up to up to 15,000. And basically you need those really high prices so that there is an economic incentive for someone to be there for those really infrequent events. Um, so 
um, if if the cap is too low, then it's not worth you having um, having a generator that you're only going to use once every year or so. Um, and so I actually wonder whether the the change in Texas is going to do the exact opposite of what they're trying to achieve because um, you reduce the cap and then, you know, if it's only 5,000, then it means that you need a much more frequent occurrence of that to make the, you know, your investment back. Um, so I was actually, I, um, you might notice if you're watching the YouTube video, I've got a different background this week. I'm in Melbourne and I was here for the uh, Australian Wind Energy Conference, um, which was on the last couple of days. And that's been really interesting. And um, at coffee in the coffee break yesterday, I was talking to a guy who works with electricity markets and modeling them. And he said to me that um, with this um, energy only market, you can usually get system security of for like a one in 10 year event. Um, you can make it economic for someone to, you know, willingly invest in something that will cover one in 10 year events. But beyond that, um, it's, it's not going to be covered by, you know, you would need a much higher price cap for someone to, you know, build something that will be used one in a hundred years, for example. So basically, yeah, increasing the, the price cap means that there's more reason for people to be ready to jump in on those rare occasions that it goes up. So yeah, surprised to see that from Texas. I, I think the solution to their problem is easy and um, obvious and not something that they want to do, which is, um, you know, more connections to the, the rest of the to other US grids. That would be, you know, just because it's a freeze in Texas, it probably isn't in, I don't know, uh, Florida or something. Um, so I think that they would get by far the best bang for their buck by um, connecting to some other local, uh, like nearby grids. Well, then they wouldn't be ready in case, you know, they finally drill and just break off I assume they're just sort of like perforating their borders, you know, so they can just like crack it and just and just drift off into the ocean and be their own country. But That's what all the oil drilling is about it's, in Texas. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's a, it's a big ruse. <laughs> Alan, what's your take on the Texas uh, situation? So obviously that was a, a big piece of news. And then, um, you know, the Railroad Commission has met recently and they're just continuing to be obvious opponents to wind energy in Texas. You know, the... Um, Texas, the chairman, Wayne uh, Christian, here's a quote by him. He said, if you add unreliable wind and solar generation and subtract re reliable natural gas generation, that equals a less reliable electric grid. Unless we fix this fuzzy math, we are simply putting a Band-Aid on the problem. So obviously misleading quotes like that um, show there continue to be people who maybe aren't quite objective to the, you know, the pros and cons of all types of energy and are still trying to trying to skew things in Texas a certain direction. Oh, sure. And anytime you put politicians into that mix and with all the uh, expenses and homes with freezing pipes and the deaths that have happened, there's, there's still a lot of pent-up anger in Texas about this, and, and probably rightly so. But you, you have to agree that all the power sources were in trouble on those days, and they need to probably – stiffen up the system a little bit, make it a little more redundant, provide uh, means of, of correcting in these icing conditions. Uh, and that's, it can't be the only condition where they're going to have something like this happen. They could have widespread fires. You could have uh, brownouts and all, all kinds of other kinds of emergency situations. And it just should be forcing ERCOT and uh, the, the, the people that are providing power in Texas to take another hard look at the system. And I, the push against wind turbines doesn't even make any sense for Texas because Texas has been the leader in the United States in wind energy pretty much forever. Uh, California was for a little while. Then, then in the early 2000s, I think that's when Texas was number one and they've continued to expand that lead. So now to have the discussion sort of 20 years too late, it's you're not going back. It's time to figure out what you have and put it to good use. And I think having more energy sources and more distributed energy sources is going to be the best thing for Texas. And I think that's where they're going to go. So we should ignore some of this noise right now and let the engineers get to work. Well, and of course, they've also just talked about some general ice related solutions obviously we had a, a number of experts on the show talk about coatings and and sensors and and blade heating um i mean rosemary what do you think texas ne needs to do if anything obviously this was a, a once in a you know a lifetime storm do they need to be doing 
you know, physical modifications to their blades. Obviously, you work for um, LM Wind Power on their blade heating systems. You know, if you were to advise them, what would you what would you say? I would say they need to look at their whole energy system and figure out how to make that reliable and do that in the cheapest way. And I'll be very surprised if the cheapest way is to add um, de-icing systems to all of their wind turbines. I mean, first of all, it's like incredibly expensive to retrofit it, but even assuming that they would just put them for every turbine coming up, uh, I mean, wind is a variable resource. We could just as easily have had the Texas freeze at a time when there was low wind speeds and and there wouldn't be any wind anyway. So, I mean, there's a difference between variability um, and reliability. And, I mean, you can have a, a reliable system that includes a lot of variable resources needs, um, you know, to have have plans in place for when there isn't any wind and isn't any sun. It's not that that's a feature of variable renewables. And so, you, you know, you need to make your whole, whole system reliable and that will be with some, some storage and it will probably be with, um, fossil fuels for a long time to come, just used less and less and less. So, I mean, like I said before, the, the easiest, cheapest thing they could do would be to connect to some other other grids. I would get a massive boost in um, in reliability that way, um, because being able to connect geographically different areas means that you don't, you know, get such a, a hit from a extreme weather event. Um, and it is worth pointing out that this was not. It wasn't like a one in a thousand year event. It was, you know, like you said, once in a generation. It's something that normally you are planning for for events of that sort of frequency. And like I said before, it's not, it's it's just at that level where it's just infrequent enough that um, the free market isn't going to solve it on its own. You need to, um, you know, you need to either set the market up so that it can solve it or you need to just pay for the extra reliability. And a lot of um, energy markets do that, um, pay pay people to have the capacity rather than to use their energy. Um, yeah, And so I would expect that it would be easier to winterize the, the gas system or like a better, a better use of the money because that's always going to be um, – available if it's if it's winterized and you know any other shock that could come as well whether it's fires or a heat wave or whatever that makes sure that you've got something that can operate through all conditions the the system is self-correcting and i just want to put this point out there i i've been doing a lot of looking at the wind turbines in texas in particular and uh sort of how they're doing financially and there are, there are a number of lawsuits have been filed about the icing condition that happened and the lack of either they didn't provide power or they overcharged for power in that time frame. So there is a feedback loop here, which is uh, in, in a legal form, which is happening now, which I think also dr- is helping to drive this maximum price down is that they realize there's there was over the last week or two, I probably saw 20 lawsuits and they're serious. I mean, there's just a lot of money at stake here. So the system and <laughs> the owners, operators and ERCOT, the Texas power utility, are all coming back and saying, hey, look, we got everybody's in litigation right now. This is crazy. Let's minimize that. Let's lower that cap down to something that's a little more reasonable. And then can we stay out of the courtroom? I, I think that's what happened. So there is a little bit of a feedback loop. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it's not completely a free market it's pretty much a free market plus this i can sue you bit uh so you know let's let it settle out a bit but i i I think it's going to get to a happy medium but i think rosemary's right also like when you put artificial constraints on you have unintended consequences that are going to happen and then you're just not going to know the effect of them until that event occurs and (laughs) we're going to find out the hard way just like we did with the ice storm Mm. It's interesting though, you lower the, the cap and obviously that, um, you know, reduces the exposure of, of um, yeah. people. And, you know, there are a lot of consumers who are on flexible tariffs who got, right. you know, $10,000 electricity bills. Yep. So you'd, you'd help that, but um, it doesn't keep the electricity on just because, you know, you say it's nope. cheaper if it's, um, yeah. you know, it doesn't, it definitely doesn't encourage investment. So usually when, um, you know, you have markets that have much tighter bands for um, the cost of electricity, then you have the government mandating um, or paying separately for capacity or, you know, like mandating the, the way that the system has to run. So mm-hmm. I kind of, I see, it's funny because Texas gives the appearance of being such a free, free market sort of um 
place, but then they've gone down this um, kind of a, the opposite direction. Yeah, it's true. I, I need to say as as well, like in a, Australia, like everybody isn't exposed to this wholesale price. Like usually, because it, it varies so much, you know, if it's a problem for you, if you suddenly had to pay fifteen thousand a megawatt hour, you'll have <laughs> a insurance. You'll buy you'll buy a cap from someone. And in Australia, it's often the snowy <laughs> snowy hydro. They've got pumped hydro, and um, they know that you know they can sell a, a cap at three hundred dollars a megawatt hour, say. And if the price goes above that, they have to sell electricity to the person with the cap, but mm. they can also generate at this high price and so they, they make it back. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm no uh, finance or market expert or, yeah, finance person, but um, it, it kind of it kind of works and um, you can buy insurance against these high prices and, um, you know, still give that feedback, that, um, yeah, feedback to the uh, generators to invest in this infrequent kind of infrastructure, infrequently used infrastructure. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's really interesting with energy <laughs> electricity markets because they're so different all over the world and there's always little nuances that are not so obvious to an outsider. Well, let's move on to uh, Siemens Gamesa. So their head, uh, Chief Executive Andreas Nowen, um, here's a quote from him recently. He said, we've probably driven it too far, referring to energy prices too, too far down low. Um, he said the industry's ability to keep investing in new technologies and factories uh, will be reduced if the drive to cut wind power continues at the same rate. The second half of that, of that um, was still his quote. So it, it, do you guys feel like that's that's correct, that the power uh, price for wind energy is becoming too cheap? And what are the I mean, what, what are the economic downfalls from that, Alan? Well, the the profit margins for the wind turbine OEMs is just going to go way too low for them to be in the business, and that and that's what's what will force consolidation eventually. And we've already seen a wave of consolidation. Gone are Clipper Wind and uh, another. Uh, I can rattle a bunch of them off. Zond uh, that are that have all been gobbled up over time. And that was a result of the prices being too low and not being able to make enough money on the on the products they were selling. You're in that same boat now uh, because you have such massive players and everybody's trying to drive the cost out of the product to be the lowest bid so they can win win a uh, a you know, large farm installation. That price puts pressure on the bottom line. You're not selling iPhones, everybody. You're selling an industrial product and. That uh, it's a it's like a commodity right now, and you don't want to be in the business of selling commodities. You want to sell things that are not commodities if you can. And GE and Siemens and uh, Nordex, Vestas are all in a commodity business, and they don't want to be there long term with with price downward price pressure. Uh, so I I think what there's what everybody's trying to say to the United States, I think this is the big player is, hey, we're not going to do these projects unless we can make money. And there may need to be some minimum level at which electricity, electricity prices are at, and that that allow us to make some more profit margin on each of these turbines, which then allows the the system to continue on. And uh, I, I, I'm really concerned about that because we're about to embark on a 30 gigawatt offshore project on the East Coast, and we're already saying that the prices are too low. Well, they're going to be a lot lower than tw in 2030 because there's going to be a lot more energy produced that way. And that can be in big trouble for these large OEM manufacturers. And so when, when Siemens Gamesa is, is commenting on the price of energy, is that because they're concerned about their operators? Because they're not making money off the energy itself. Yeah. They're just making money off their turbines. How does that whole ecosystem work? Um, I mean, does the cost of energy impact the price they're going to sell it? Sure, for? because the 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 companies in the uh, the investment groups now that are investing in wind or are, are, have all the Excel spreadsheets and are, are sitting there with the green visors on, going through the accounting books and going, we can make money at this project at this price. And if that price drops down too low, we're going to lose our shirt. And there's already been some companies go bankrupt in the United States uh, that have been involved in wind. And you, you really don't want that. As we were talking about with Texas, instability in your power market is a bad thing to have. And I, I, I think what Siemens is saying is it's a correct 
thing to say right now, which is if you drive the price of energy down too low, it makes it very hard for us to sell wind turbines. It forces us to reduce our margins so we're competitive. And then no one's making any money. We're doing this for free. No one's going to, to make wind turbines and install wind turbines and maintain wind turbines for free. And that's the dilemma. So you can't add too much capacity onto a system that it's starting to feel like is overwhelmed with capacity. Okay. So if I'm going to use another farm analogy, if the price of wheat is too low, no one wants to farm. So therefore no one wants to buy tractors. Is that kind of same yeah, thing? Yeah, it's exactly it. And in, in the United States, we have price minimums. Like uh, we're, I'm up in Massachusetts, which is right next to Vermont, and they have control prices for milk. Like we pay a lot more than what milk is worth. <laughs> we do uh, because there's there's minimum uh, uh, amounts for for milk, and that exists in other in, a, in grain and someone and it used to be in grain markets and a bunch of other cattle markets and. Why would energy be any different than that? Because because it's a staple, right? We, we all need it to survive today. What would we do if I couldn't try and charge my iPhone? I don't know what I would do. Uh, and and so there, uh, you have political forces at will that drive those decisions. Like how do you how do you establish a milk price in Vermont? Well, you have a lot of political pressure from the the farmers and the communities to do that, and so the politicians do it. Doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it long term right in particular. But that's what happens in at least the American system. I don't know about other systems, but it, that's what happens here. Well, speaking of which, Rosemary, what's your favorite Ben and Jerry's flavor? And then Alan, you're going next. Uh, putting on, I'm putting I you on the spot. I don't like it that much. You can't I don't like about, it that much. Uh, uh, see me either. I don't. I don't care for Ben and Jerry's. Imagine. Well, then I uh, will support too, the Vermont dairy sweet. industry because there's <laughs> s'mores flavor, Netflix and chill. I mean, come on. Ben and Jerry's is amazing. Shame on both of you. Not supporting <laughs> no, Vermont they just dairy. Put too, it's too too much flavor and it's too sweet. Um, People so, hate flavor. I know. I know. <clears throat> I would like half the, I like the strawberry cheesecake ones. Okay. But, um, <laughs> well, I had it once and I'm like, yeah, if there was half the amount of sugar in this, then it would be, you know, like a good, <laughs> good ice cream. You haven't been properly. So if it was more like a lump of coal, then you'd be good. <laughs> or maybe like a bowl of warm oatmeal, unflavored. <laughs> We're learning a lot about Rosemary in this episode. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, Rosemary, what's your what's your take on, on these prices? I mean, um, obviously, this is pretty concerning because everyone's like, hey, we're building. This is great. We're building so many projects. But now everyone's like, ugh, we need to make money. I mean, is, there, is this a solvable problem? What do you see needs to happen to redirect this course? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a good solution, but I think that the problem is pretty much what Alan was saying. And I definitely do get the feeling that it is becoming more like a commodity market. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to branch out into other aspects of the, the energy transition and get into, you know, storage and electric vehicles and, um, you know, all the, all the fun stuff. Um, because it, it, wind energy is mostly about, um, price reductions now and it's gotten so competitive ever since the reverse auction started. Um, it just, uh, uh, yeah, like really, really started to massively reduce prices. And I, I think it would be fine if we had um, a longer amount of time to do this energy transition. You know, like it's it's great to have cheap <laughs> cheap energy and eventually, I mean, no one has to sell a wind turbine that they're going to lose money on, obviously, but um, we, we continue to need more of this power. And um, so, you know, there has to be, there has to be a market. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that uh, the the risk is kind of that uh, companies are uh, reducing their mar- margins so much and becoming yeah more like a, a, a commodity kind of market that then they don't have the capability to do exciting new technology and um, you know solve problems that way. I think one thing that's going to happen is we're going to move away from this like cost like f- pure focus on cost. Um, which was important for, you know, getting from zero to maybe 20% variable renewables in the grid. And now we really need to focus to the next part of the problem, which is about value, about making renewable energy when when there's dirty energy in the grid, because what's the point in adding, you know, more more renewables in the middle of the day when you've got more solar power than there is demand? It, it doesn't <laughs> help the environment to make more energy then. Um, so I think that 
wind is probably going through maybe its hardest time now um, because it can't continue much longer. There's like obsessive focus on on the cost of the cheapest megawatt hour. We're definitely going to get to the point where it, it matters when when you produce the energy. Yeah. And I think one of the issues in the United States, guys, is that, uh, you know, what it, the wind turbine manufacturers are very savvy. They, they, they know where the profit centers lie. And there's really two, right? There's two expenses in uh, wind turbines, the leasing part, getting the land, or in the case offshore, getting access to the the, sh- the water and the cost of the turbine. The transmission line is another third element to that, but it also that has to do with land also, I think. Uh, so if I'm Siemens and I playing this game right, what I'm trying to do is lower the cost of the leases down so I can keep my prices up in my turbines. Because what is the price of the ocean, really? To the U.S. government, what what does that even mean, right? It, it it could be given away if they really wanted to do it. They could give it away, it's, but they're charge they're they're charging now for that access. And the same thing's going to happen when they do the transmission lines coming on shore. They're going to pay a pretty penny to do that. And if I'm Siemens, I'm saying, well, you know, it's just a trench, right? Why don't you just make that essentially free? Just give us right of way. Give the you know the transmission line right away, so they're not paying landowners a, a yearly stipend and that'll allow us to keep the prices of wind turbines up. So there's a game being played right now. There's a lot of maneuvering going on and the leases is, is probably where the that one profit center can, you know, the US government can take a smaller share, <laughs> essentially, and let the OEMs uh, make a little more money. Well, along the same line, I mean, Equinor, uh, which is a multinational company uh, state owned by Norway, um, they have now done some research and have declared their investment in the Dogger Bank offshore wind farm, which is the world's largest offshore project uh, currently under construction, that that investment is going to be unprofitable. Um, you know, this is a, a really stark situation where people are like, oh, man, this impressive asset is losing people money already. Um, Rosemary, do you feel like this is going to be really scary for other players who now are maybe going to rethink their decision to invest in offshore wind? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is that um, what I think of when I hear the word unprofitable is that it lost them money, whereas what they're saying is that it doesn't meet their um, level of return, that they they have a minimum level of return that they expect to get, and it hasn't exceeded that. So it doesn't mean that it has literally lost them money, and I, I don't think it has, actually, reading between the lines. I think that they made some money, but just not as much as they would have if they went and, you know, drilled for oil somewhere, which is what they make most of their money from. So that's one um one point to start on. But secondly, I mean, offshore wind, it's the levelized cost of energy out of offshore wind is about double what it is for onshore. So, uh, of, of course, I mean, that's, that's a, a fact that's true for, you know, every, every offshore wind farm. So they're not, um, there's, I am actually wondering, and some of my colleagues in the industry are wondering, what is going on with offshore wind? Why is it booming when it's still, you know, you get the same electrons at the end of the day out of uh, out of your outlet? So, you know, what is causing people to, you know, make this um, so many projects where you'll have double the cost of energy that you would from an, an onshore wind farm? And one thing at this conference I was at, there were um, there were a few offshore um, developers that were there. The biggest one is a Star of the South, which we've talked about before. It's a 2.2 gigawatt um, uh, project planned for Victoria. Um, and they were saying that, you know, with the, the offshore wind, it's not it's not about cost. It's, they're, they're probably never going to be on onshore wind on cost. It's about several different values that they have. And the one is that what I was saying before where, you know, the um, offshore wind, it has uh, sometimes a better correlation with high electricity prices. So, you know, this Victorian site that they're proposing, one of the big benefits is that they say that, you know, the wind speeds are highest in the evening, which is when electricity prices are high because the solar is all turned off. Um, so that's one thing. But then they also mentioned a few other things and especially social license, you know. Um, so people are getting more and more starting to oppose uh, onshore wind farms because they don't want to live near them. So offshore wind is a way to get around that. And then the third value that they mentioned was um, local local manufacturing, local jobs. You know, they have a big push um, to get 
jobs back into these regions that you know are traditionally um, coal mining regions um, where this this wind farm is and maybe we'll get I mean we'll definitely get more manufacturing um, for for certain aspects of it so yeah they were they were saying that they're really keen to see governments give clear guidance on what they value so that you can plan the right projects and if you're only valuing low-cost energy then you wouldn't be building offshore wind so I think that's clear. I think the inflationary pressures are going to have a big problem uh, in wind. And if I can keep my money in the bank and not develop a wind site, which is very difficult to do to begin with, I just keep the money in the bank and I make a higher percentage return on investment just by, by sticking it in the stock market or putting in a mutual fund, essentially, is what a company would do. Then why would I spend all the time, money and effort to, to establish a wind, wind site? I, th- I think there's the realist uh, approach to this, and there's a lot of financial people here. Is it's just not uh, an investment. A wind isn't an investment in its own standing alone. It's in comparison to everything else in the world, and it has to have a certain amount of return on investment for it to be willing to do it. So you don't, you're not losing money necessarily. You are gaining money, but you're not gaining the money you would have made to do nothing. And if doing nothing's easier, you're gonna like you're gonna get a lot of takers of doing nothing, and that. That's the problem with the inflation that's happening in the United States right now. It gets more and more likely that companies will do nothing. Well, and another problem is the potential bottlenecks with the grid. So more and more states are talking about their difficulties um, with getting their grid up to snuff to support the increased capacity these offshore wind farms um, can generate. So here's a quote from Princeton professor uh, Jesse Jenkins, who co-authored a study about this recently. He said the, the current power grid took 150 years to build. Now to get to net zero emissions by 2050, we have to build that amount of tra- transmission again in the next 15 years and then build that much more again in the 15 years after that. So we're hitting this like logarithmic curve of how much transmission capacity we need. And that seems like a really big challenge. So, I mean, Alan, is there is this solvable? I mean, this seems like a really gigantic problem that we have to tackle now. Yeah, it's not going to be solvable. It won't. And and the reason is uh, sort of twofold. Uh, The most expensive land in America is along the shoreline. So if if the plan is to put a lot of offshore wind in, at some point, you got to put a transmission line to come on shore or transmission lines to come on shore and plus substations and all kinds of infrastructure. And you're going to do it on the most expensive land on the planet in some places. And, and that just will never fly. And if you look at the infrastructure for the United States on the way the power grid is set up, it's set up from the inside out, right? So your power generation is not next to the shoreline typically. So your your ends of the transmission lines are at the shoreline. And now you want to start plugging in massive amounts of energy in the weakest spot. That's just not going to, to work. So you, you need to do a lot of infrastructure changes and transmission lines and, and transformers. The whole thing is going to be a significant change along shorelines and, and other parts of the United States. And I'm not sure America is ready for that. right? Because if we talk about like what's happening in San Francisco, and I think it's going to happen on the East Coast here, where they're outlawing natural gas, right? they're not going to let you – Heat a home with natural gas. Well, that only leaves electricity. That's it. So if you, but if you don't have the grid to support all the extra electricity, and it takes a lot of electricity to heat a home, you know, in my neck of the woods, it takes a lot. Uh, that puts a lot of extra uh, load capacity on, on, on the grid, which is not designed for. So we do need to build more infrastructure. The question is, at this stage and this mature of a system in the United States, can you modify, double it, quadruple it in a couple of years without causing a lot of havoc? And the answer to that would be totally no. You're going to cause havoc when you do that. And that's going to be a, one of the leading impediments to some of the renewables is the fact you just can't get the electricity where you want it to go. Yeah, I think um, grid connection it was something, I think it's a number one issue in Australia that developers raise that uh, having problems, not just with the, I mean, there's some areas that they say are, are full, the grid is just full, There's no, you can't put any more <laughs> renewables projects in because the grid can't handle it. But more commonly, it's a problem of um, just the time to connect because, you know, the... Um, 
the grid operator has to be able to figure out what's going to happen to the grid stability when your project comes online and that's taking a long time um, currently and, and people are worried. Um, and I think that, Alan, you're right and um, the, the guy that you quoted, Dan, is right that the the grid challenge that you see, that won't get, that won't get fixed. But I don't think that that's the only way to do it. I think that's kind of, um, in a way, it's like fossil fuel thinking. That's, you know, that was a kind of grid that suited fossil fuels um, and it developed slowly. We don't have the time to, you know, spend another 150 years um, remaking the grid to suit renewables. But I think a few other things are going to happen. First is distributed energy um, with, you know, rooftop solar, um, maybe household batteries or community batteries to, you know, stop the energy from having to travel so far. Um, that's going to be one thing that will will help. And then secondly, um, the, a couple of things that they talked about at this conference that I was at was first the, the grid getting Ubered, they said. So, you know, like um, just new developers are seeing this huge roadblock in grid connection and so they're choosing not not to so where there's a choice so i mean in australia there's um a lot of projects that are geared towards or planned projects that are geared towards hydrogen export so then they've got no you know if you take away the need to connect to the grid then you can locate it wherever you want and i'm not saying that <laughs> <laughs> that hydrogen is a really simple way to deal with a problem, yeah. but for the for the projects that are planning to make hydrogen anyway, they're, they're never going to connect to the grid. Um, you can also do a similar thing with manufacturing. So, you know, we see like aluminium smelters and some steel. They're building their own um, renewable energy um, and they they won't necessarily, they will either won't connect to the grid or they won't upgrade their grid connection because they'll be um, self-reliant. And then the third thing is actually something that governments are doing, which I think is really good in Australia. It's state governments. Um, they're building these renewable energy zones. So they will identify an area that, you know, has renewable energy potential. And then they will commit to putting the infrastructure in place, you know, building up the connection to the, the backbone of the grid. Make sure that it's somewhere that the, one, the community wants it there. Um, two, it's got good resources. And I'm assuming that they're also going to choose places that have, you know, good um, potential in terms of environmental impact. It would have a, a low environmental impact there. Um, so they're kind of, and then they'll get people to, to bid on, bid in on projects there. So it's kind of, you know, a bit, a bit coordinated and, um, makes that problem easier. So I think. Definitely the grid's a big problem, but we don't need to solve it the same way that we, you know, solve the problem with getting fossil fuel generation generated electricity to houses. We can we can, you know, start again from a new way of thinking and, and solve it in a probably a smarter way. Moving on, uh, GE and ORE catapult are teaming up. Uh, they've uh, pledged some money towards academic research that's going to help them determine how they, they could potentially uh, decrease costs for offshore wind in the future, um, obviously enabling full remote uh, operations, you know, ways to troubleshoot the turbines, uh, health condition monitoring, prognostic technologies, uh, all these different technologies where they can, you know, essentially be more hands off seems to be like what part of the, the research that they want to conduct to figure out how can we reduce manpower, uh, obviously make this safer and easier to project when we need to fix these things and how well they're doing without too much human intervention. Um, Alan, I mean, do you think is that that's one of the bigger costs is getting people out to these places and that automating them out is one of the bigger cost savings? Is that seem to be their big goal or is there something else that maybe I'm missing? Well, yeah, it's replacement of parts and downtime are, are part of that answer and then the, the having humans available all the time to to go out and and fix turbines is a, is a huge cost center uh, so once you have purchased the turbine where are your costs coming from they're coming from parts uh generic uh, maintenance and the cost of having a staff to go do that or paying someone to go do that and when you get to this to this level where you're you squeezed out all the margin everywhere else the, sort of the last place to go is people. So they're going to try to automate as much as they can and take the people out of the system. And this isn't the first time this has happened in industrial society. But when they this, – this is my little complaint about the, the, the green jobs aspect and knowing full well that 
all the engineers at all the OEMs are trying to eliminate all the green jobs because it costs money for the operators and the owners. And so to be efficient, they got to eliminate all those things. So as the profit margins get squeezed, guys, uh, this industry is going to get really, really tight. And it's going to it's not going to be the uh, utopia that we were promised. That is for sure. But uh, there has to be some balancing factor, right? And what that is now, I don't really know. Because right now, I would have said two years ago, man, wind energy is going to 2019. Yeah, we're going to roll this thing. It's going to be big. And now we're seeing the opposite of we're saying like, whoa, 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 whoa. No one's making money at this. We need to slow down. <laughs> so how the, t- the tide has turned. And I, I always say, I still say it now, is that inflationary pressure is going to be a big deal. And, and until the United States decides to to wake up and realize that five, six, seven percent inflationary pressure on raw materials is a problem, then the wind turbine industry is going to suffer. A lot of industries are going to, going to suffer. So it's not just about the green energy push. It's not just about uh, green jobs. At some point, someone's got to make some money. Or everybody needs to make some money in the system, and they're not going to be able to do it. And that's trouble. So fix the bigger problem. Let's get the economy back rolling again and get inflationary pressures levelized. And then I think wind is going to be a great investment. I really do. So moving on, uh, interesting article from Offshore Magazine. And this one's talking about um, offshore carbon capture storage activities and how some of these are being sold at lease sales. So recently, lease sale 257 uh, took place and ExxonMobil uh, acquired offshore blocks for this purpose of offshore carbon capture and storage. Um, Rosemary, can you take us through this a little bit? Because this seems, um, I don't know, th- I think this is something that's probably flying under the radar a bit. Yeah, well, I hadn't seen this particular story until you you shared it with me. So it was under my radar too. But it um, it is interesting because, it, yeah, I've been spending a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of 2021 trying to figure out what's going on with carbon capture and storage because you kind of have two sort of like contradictory things being said. On the one hand, that, um, that carbon capture and storage is a mature technology and we can capture, you know, 99% of emissions and store it safely. And, you know, they say that the, the cost to do that, you know, sometimes people are saying it's in the tens of dollars per, per tonne of, of CO2 saved. On the other hand, we've been trying to do carbon capture and storage, trying very hard, lots of very motivated governments and companies <laughs> very keen for this to happen. Since the 90s, we've been trying and there are almost no successful projects in the world. Um, the ones that are succeeding are overwhelmingly to where there's a value for the, the carbon dioxide to, you know, for example, well, nearly entirely an enhanced, enhanced oil recovery where you put CO2 underground, but you're doing it so that you can push more oil out um, and, you know, obviously burn that and... Um, and so it has a, so it has a value, whereas the CO2 that we put into the atmosphere has traditionally not been valued or preventing it has not been valued. So I've been waiting because, you know, I, I, I think it's true that it is a mature technology because all of the steps in it, they do that in other industries, you know, the, um, uh, Natural gas, for example, you know, if they want to transport that, then they have to get all the CO2 out of it. Otherwise, it freezes in their equipment. And um, so yeah, there's examples for every step of um, other industries doing it successfully, but always with the difference that there's a value in, in it for them, which there hasn't been in CCS. But on the other hand, you know, the prices that they're saying that we would need to reach for a price on carbon for it to stand on its own two feet, we're getting to the point where you do have carbon prices that are around that. And I haven't been seeing any, you know, companies making, yeah, rushing to to do projects on it. So I was kind of starting to wonder about that. And so, yeah, maybe this is the that piece of the puzzle being filled in. It is a company seeing that there's a business case for it, perhaps. Right. And, the, the, and Rosemary, I think this goes back to a conversation from a couple of weeks ago. So when I was reviewing this article, I was thinking, oh, we, had, we just had this conversation about we need to have carbon tax for carbon capture. And I was saying, no, I don't think we do. I think we're, I think the marketplace is going to take the role of this or large companies are going to step in and, and do this. I think we're already seeing it now. And, and maybe just because I've been reviewing all these sort of contracts that uh, large industries in America, like Facebook, 
are buying electricity from wind turbine sites. And I'm they have so much cash, they don't know what to do with it. And so part of their mission is to uh, make the world a more environmentally uh, uh, regulated place. And they're going to put their some of the money they're making into carbon capture, I think. And it's just a weird way of going about it, I think, because you wouldn't assume that's what's happening. But a lot of large uh, industries in the, United, in the United States are buying the 20-year electricity leases from these wind turbine sites, which in lowering the carbon going into the atmosphere. And I, I would guess that Tesla and some of the other ones are also going to do the carbon capture and just, and the government will support it too in terms of tax breaks. But I think that's going to happen. And I don't think we're going to end up having a carbon tax in the United States, which is weird because I, I've always assumed it's going to happen. Do you, you still still think carbon tax is going to happen in the all over the world? When I say carbon tax, I mean you, you need a way to value the, the carbon. True. So a price on carbon, a tax on carbon, some sort of value so that there's a reason to stick it underground instead of just letting it into the atmosphere. I mean, without that, there I, I don't think there's a business case for CCS because why would you? Uh, other than, I guess, yeah, the companies that are trying hard to go net zero because of the, you know, the, the PR, the sure. PR for that or the, you know, the, the nice feeling. And I do think that... Um, so CCS, it's much more expensive way to reduce emissions than it is to go with renewables. Right. So I don't think that, uh, I mean, I'm quite sure that there's no scope that we're going to just be putting CCS on coal power plants and continuing to operate as normal. It's right. just like the economics are just not there, not even the thermodynamics. You know, you add 20, 30%, um, you use 20, 30% of your electricity that you're generating to, or the power that you're generating to um, you run your CCS. So it's just... You know, <laughs> it's not not plausible that we're just going to stick it on like a band aid. Um, but I do prefer it for for hard to abate um, sectors, and you know, assuming that you know the trajectory we're on, we're going to overshoot. You know, the carbon budget that would lead to a nicely habitable planet um, will need that technology. And in the meantime, I do prefer CCS to you know some of the more sketchy. Um, carbon offsets that can be bought. You can get really cheap carbon offsets yeah. to, yeah, like pay the um, Zimbabwean farmer not to cut down a tree right. and, um, you know, take take their word for it that they weren't going to, that they were planning to cut it down and now they right. won't ever, you know. Um, so I think, you know, like if you're a, a billionaire that wants to keep on jet setting around the world and um, allay your conscious, I, I think that, um, that that's a, a, a better way to do it than, other alternatives. And I think in, by 2050, CCS will be important for that last sliver of emissions once we've done everything we can with the easy yeah. stuff. So I'm, I'm glad to see progress. Yeah. Last on the lineup today is a fun piece of tech. It's fun, at least because I think it's fun, uh, is this uh, Japanese startup PowerX that instead of bringing offshore wind energy onshore via cables they want to take a container ship out there filled with batteries and essentially drive the power back and this just it, it just like hurts my brain and it makes me laugh because electricity <laughs> is a thing that's always existed in you know in this intangible realm and yet yeah. you think of like oh uncle rufus is pulling up in his pickup truck everyone go <laughs> grab some go help my load go grab out the electricity like that's that's like the way i think about this Obviously, this makes sense. Like you can have, you know, so many batteries in one of these huge ships and bring it back on shore. And I'm sure they've run the numbers that this makes some amount of financial sense. But it just seems it just seems bizarre. You just don't think of transporting an asset like this in this kind of way. Um, Rosemary, what's what's your take on this uh, startup PowerX? Um, I find it hard to believe this is going to be the the simpler solution. Um, I think, I mean, yeah, subsea cables are, are really expensive, um, but I, prices are, are gradually coming down probably, and um, I would struggle to believe that this uh, shipping batteries back and forth will be a solution. But for me, the most amusing part of it was that the ship is, it's not an, an electric ferry. It's, it's powered by LNG. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's true. I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. To me, that was just like the ice on the cake of um, uh, do, do you believe in um, clean electricity or or not? It's yeah, yeah it's weird. <laughs> well, and they got an investment of a billion yen, which is eight point eight four million dollars. So I'm also not wow. sure how big of a ship this can build you because that's not even like a mega yacht. That's like a no. nothing size ship. Yeah. So curious, you know, because they talk about 
Um, it says here the first, this article from um, Nikki.com, N-I-K-K-E-I, the first vessel will adopt container ship designs. But, I mean, a container ship is a, what, $5 billion ship, $10 billion? No, I mean, they're no, gigantic. No. I mean, so complex. Yeah, yeah. 20, they're, they're huge. So what does an eight eight point eight four million dollar ship look like, and how can that be relevant in this? In this, I don't know. You have to make so many trips back and forth. You know, buy Uncle Rufus a huge truck, then he can bring back way more electricity from the orchard. You know, I don't know. <laughs> well, in the United States, Dan, we're already having discussion of how you're going to get uh, energy onshore, and there's, there's big fights going on about where are you going to put that cable. And one of the one of the concerns is is that you're going to have to put multiple cables in coming along the beaches. And Japan is like the east coast of the United States in the sense that you, you're there's not a lot of beachfront there. You're going to be able to do that on without ecological impacts and uh, visibility impacts. You're going to have to people just aren't going to like it. Uh, so there, I think there is a potential place for this because if you if you have existing ports, you can unload the electricity from unlike unlike we unload liquefied natural gas which we do right now on the east coast we have these big containers that sit there and we unload uh natural gas it's we ship oil across the world all the time so the the concept's not crazy i don't think that's where it is i think i think it's whether the marketplace develops because it's hard to get that energy on shore and there may be some places in the united states where dragging a cable across the bottom of the ocean may be proved difficult and I mean, maybe the case in Japan, actually, uh, tsunamis, whatever, it may make it very difficult. So it, even as a fallback for Japan to have sort of containerized electricity may not be a bad idea. And I'm, what I'm, if they're going to play around with it, now's the time to play around with it, right? Figure it out now and see if it is a marketplace. Because I, I bet you there's some place in this world that, where that will catch on. And maybe it's Japan, maybe it's the United States, maybe it's Australia. Who knows? You have to remember Japan's got a harder energy transition than a lot of places. Like Australia has it really easy. I don't, we're not going to see this in Australia. Um, and I mean, uh, I, I think they bury the cables, don't they? I've, I've been around plenty of offshore wind farms where they join the shore and it's not some noticeable, ugly thing. I can't even, I can't even picture in my mind what, <laughs> what it looked like onshore. Um, so I, I don't think that that has to be a big problem. Um, yeah, but Japan's got a, a tough, a tough problem. I, I accept that Japan has to has to consider a broader range of issues than what we have to in Australia. So they're already talking about putting the uh, uh, substations out in the water in the United States. That's already a conversation that started. They're saying instead of bringing multiple cables in, we need to basically have a floating uh, transformer station that all the cables connect to, so we only have one feet onto the shoreline. And if we're having that just conversation now, that means. We're getting ready to have a fight. Uh, there's a lot of interest at play. And I, I kind of wonder if if uh, alternative solutions will not pop up because I can I can imagine this in my head. There's a big community meeting talking about the cable that's going to dig this trench and it's going to be 8 million volts on this cable underground and my little dog's going to walk across and get electrified. Can we mitigate that? I think it's a, it's a realistic conversation you'll have in America. Probably it'll happen up and down the East Coast. Uh, what do you do about that? First of all, that? if your little dog is on the shore, it's going to get eaten by a crocodile. Have you seen those terrifying <laughs> videos of Florida? Yes. Keep your little dog away from the Inside, shoreline if you value yes. your little dog. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah but so you, sad. You but. know, Dan, that's, you know I'm right about that, that, that they will have a lot of discussions about this high voltage line underground sure but i think as rosemary said they're buried pretty deep until they're not i know there were some that were sort of getting uncovered that Block weren't Island. buried that deep in, in new, new yeah new england yeah my neighborhood but to me this you know like what's going to be the markup on this electricity as they bring it in on shore and the smaller the vessel the higher that markup's got to be and then if they want to invest in a bigger ship they're gonna buy so many batteries and then every couple of years those batteries pale in comparison to the next generation of battery capacity. It just seems like an exhausting thing to do this for a lot, the long term. Whereas if you invest in the cable, yeah, it's a million dollars or $2 million a mile, but at the same time, it's going to be in operation for decades, right? Maybe. Whereas this, this just does, doesn't seem like a feasible long-term solution. I think there's a place for it in Japan. I really do. And I, I think, uh, just keep track of this. Put your yen where you, put your yen where your mouth is. Then Alan. put some money in this. Be the first. Yeah, put another yeah. eight million into the project yeah. and really kick it off. Okay. 
Yeah, then they can have two <laughs> two dinghies to bring to, to bring electricity back on. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I'm really curious what a, I'm going to have to Google what a ship what, what you can get for nine million dollars as far as a ship. Because I feel yeah. like Jeff Bezos's yacht was like one hundred fifty million dollars. I think that's right. Anyway, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. So let's just ask him to borrow his on weekends to to <laughs> bring electricity on shore. <laughs> He's looking for good PR, I'm sure. I'm sure he'll oblige. <laughs> but anyway, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you listen. Uh, be sure to uh, subscribe to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter, and to Rosemary's YouTube channel. Definitely check them out. Uh, obviously, Nick Aldern, our previous guest, is going to be on with her. So check out that live stream replay if you get a chance. We'll see you here next week on Uptime. Operating a profitable wind farm is all about mitigating costs, minimizing risks, and being efficient with maintenance, repairs, and upgrades. It's incredibly expensive to send a team of rope access technicians up tower to make even simple repairs. We also know how costly lightning damage can be, requiring inspection, repairs, and downtime for even minor lightning strikes. Maximize the time efficiency of your techs and prevent future lightning damage by installing our Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your crews are going up on ropes. Learn more in today's show notes or visit us on the web at weatherguardwind.com.